Welcome to another episode of The Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Camisa, and this is Derek Tam Scott. What happened to your face? You didn't even notice that I didn't insert a hyphen or a discount sandler. That's how you greet me? I, did you say stuff? I didn't hear you say anything. <laughs> I was this too is busy what my face shocking. actually looks like. This is what my face looks like. This is what my hair looks like. This is what happens when I've had enough with the whole like looking like a homeless person. And, Did you have uh, a breakup or some other traumatic event? Like I went oh. to go speak to one of my neighbors who I've never spoken to about a shared piece of land where there's a big fire hazard. And I pulled up in a Kia and I was in flip flops and you know, like a, a hiking outfit basically with my hair like out to here and like a, a disgusting beard. And she's like, she didn't want to open the door. And I was like, okay, it's time to reacquaint myself with a razor. <laughs> and so I did. And I haven't been clean shaven in years. And this is what I look like. And every time I look in the mirror, I'm like, <gasps> what the fuck happened? So <clears throat> thank you for... Wow. Thank you for, uh, A, always looking the same, you bastard. And B, pointing out that I look completely different to the audience. Especially those who are watching this on, uh, or listening to this on a podcast app. So now you're going to have to describe... For them, in kind words, what I look like. Um, I'm sorry, kind words? Yeah, better start I, with 10 years younger. <laughs> uh, yes, maybe more than 10 years. Really? Well, I don't know, you said kind words, I was doing my best to... I didn't uh, say lie, <laughs> I didn't say kind <laughs> lies. <laughs> oh, we should probably talk about some, some automotive subjects now. That much of a subject change. This is going in your permanent record, Derek Tam hyphen Scott, um, or is just oh, payback. Now that you from, run HR. Yeah, well, it could also just be payback for me inventing the hyphen nickname for you. That seems to have stuck. Like every time anyone references you in YouTube comments, they call you hyphen, or on Reddit, they're like, "What's up with hyphen?" And I'm like, "I live for this." <clears throat> well, congratulations on that. I think it's best when people. My favorite comment was someone was saying that they had read, uh, or when they were reading my name in written, they pronounced the hyphen out loud, or like it as, a, as a hyphen, as opposed to not pronouncing it. I read that one too, I laughed so hard. <clears throat> <laughs> Look, uh, it's better than calling you like DeVille Touring Sedan, or like, you know, pointing uh, out that you're named after the world's most ghetto Cadillac. I know, and my brother's first name starts with a G. Uh, yeah. So he gets the good letter, right? Because GTS is like GTS. yes, yes, and nine twenty eight, and Ferrari three hundred eight, and three twenty eight, and three forty eight, and three fifty five, and I get the. You just get the Deville touring sedan. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, I had a song planned, and I don't remember it now. All I can think of is like James Taylor's "Whenever I See Your Smiling Face." I have to smile myself because you look like a douchebag or whatever the words were. Um, now I'm like all self-conscious about the way I look. Is there something You're I not going to sing the one. Uh, doesn't Johnny Cash have a song about a Cadillac that he gets out of the. Uh, I'm covering my face out of, out of embarrassment. Cadillac out of what? One, one piece at a time. And he does it over the course of years. So the car has no specific year because all the pieces are from different years. It's a Johnny Cash song about yeah. Cadillacs. This is before I was born, when you were in your prime. Yeah. Um, okay, so <clears throat> let's talk about cars. And not Johnny Cash cars, but something to do with cash and cars. So this all kind of relates to it itself-ish. So I have this friend who's a genuinely nice guy. Oh, God. Pretentious. You're, you're about to say something terrible if you're like, this person oh, is yeah. a nice person. Oh yeah, you know me so well. Um, <laughs> okay, he's a genuinely nice guy, and he's got however a really cool cars. However, <laughs> he did. I, I was scrolling through the facial book feed, and I'm like, damn, yeah, blah blah blah, political, political, political. Oh, cats, political, political. Oh, cute puppies, political, political. What the? F and it all came down to he is taking a like 90 day consulting gig in some other state, and is like, hey, uh, my Alfa Romeo Giulia Quadrifoglio is gonna be sitting for 90 days. Uh, so if someone wants to rent it, like sublease it for me, all they have to do is cover, cover the payment and you know, I guess insurance or whatever. I didn't, I didn't look too much detail because I was too horrified at the number. Did you see this? Because you know him too. Oh, the, for the, so yeah, so it was 11 
25 a month. I, yeah. I think. Like, and I'm thinking, okay, $1,125 plus insurance. So we're going to have to think realistically $1,400 a month. Would I, every other day, put a $100 bill in my driveway and light it on fire for the pleasure of having an Alpha Julia Quadrifolio in my driveway? Because that's what you're doing, right? Every $15 I mean, a day. That sounds a lot like any Alfa Romeo ownership experience. But at least those cars eventually incinerate themselves and you get all the money back from your insurance. <laughs> I mean, I just, it just got me thinking like... <clears throat> I, this guy's, I don't know what his financial situation, it doesn't quite matter. $1,200 a month to lease a car. Could you? Isn't that normal? Isn't that what most people do when they lease cars? I'm, so I've never leased a car. Um, no, no. I mean, maybe but like in most like Beverly high end cars are leased. No, I don't know. Yeah, what, yeah. So over or in the. In the financed? Over, it, finance or leased. I mean, almost no one pays cash. I think I just saw. Uh, a report the other day that the number of cars that are leased in the U.S. had been hovering between 30 and 35 percent for most of the last couple of years, and it's down to 25 percent for some unknown reason. Um, and my guess is it has to do with payments, but we'll get back to that in a second. I'm going to say the average person probably spends somewhere in the order of three to five hundred dollars a month on a car lease. Um, and, and let me also say that I absolutely love and adore the Alfa Romeo Giulia. I think it's the best sports sedan on the market. The Quadrifoglio is just, therefore, the best version of the best sports sedan on the market. Um, I just can't... Like, $1,200 a month is a mortgage payment, in, and a big one in most of the United States. Um, and it's... I, I just can't believe that someone would do that. Now, and it's, there's, there are extenuating circumstances in his case. This is not about bashing him, because he does rent it out on Turo, and he, you know, he... He made the decision to lease this ex- incredibly expensive car so that uh, with the, the Toro uh, revenue in mind. So really his uh, actual cost would be less than that. That's not why we're here. Why we're here is because if you average out, if you take all of the money I've ever spent on a car in my life and then subtract all of the money that I've gotten back from it when they've caught themselves on fire and I've made an insurance claim <clears throat> or sold it, I guarantee you I have had a fleet of 25 cars over the last... 20 years um, that have totaled in total cost to me negative either I've broken even yeah but you spend hours and hours and hours like ministering to them so you value your time at zero less than zero my time is absolutely less than zero (laughs) so (laughs) (laughs) I mean would it like let let me ask you this I'm genuinely curious and I don't expect a spreadsheet answer but on your average car you know, you buy funky old cars. We've discussed this before. Like, what would you do if you lost $1,200 a month on one of those cars? I mean, Does I've done some dumb... No, I've done some... Mm, maybe that 164 because I owned it for less than a month. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, fair enough. But you put, like, lots of miles on it. Yes, I did also put over 1,200 miles on it. Okay. So, I mean, that's a dollar a mile if you lost 1200 bucks. It's I, I just start thinking about like the most expe- the, the most expensive automotive experience I ever had was my 996. So in February of 05, I bought a 2996 because I was going to be hot shit and I thought I was making a financially secure decision. It was 40,000 bucks. Car had I think 40,000 miles on it or something like that. And I'm like looking at 993 prices, which was my only basis for comparison and I'm like they never go below 40 grand. Like, it just doesn't happen. So therefore, my 996, which was ugly as sin, shouldn't have gone below $40,000. And boy, was I fucking wrong. <laughs> yeah, because those cars are still, a decade and a half later, worth, like, especially in conver- convertible form, worth $14,000 on Craigslist. Funny Sorry, enough, asking $14,000 on Craigslist. Right. Although Let's nice see. ones, nice late whatever ones, I, a friend of mine's buying one for twenty eight at the moment. But, um, you know, it's got some mods and it's kind of the right car. My Does car it have was, a roof? It's a convertible. No, it's a convertible. Oh, okay. um, maybe he's completely overpaying. I don't know. Sorry if he's listening. I, I didn't do my research, but I looked at the car and I'm like, yeah, thumbs up. Looks great. Anyway, but I sold that car on 7-7 of 07. I'll never forget that because it was my lucky day. Uh, and I got $30,500 out of it. So I had the car for two and a half years and it cost me 9000 bucks, Plus, you know, brakes, and which I did a couple times because I tracked it. And 
um, a muffler blew out and like other weird little stuff. I probably all in lost 1100 bucks on the car. Oh, 11,000 bucks on the car over two and a half years. And I was devastated. I was like, you stupid. I don't have a beep machine. POS. Um, oh, wait. Oh, you think I have a nasty mouth to other people? You should see what I call myself. But I, I was really upset that I had lost that kind of money. That is nothing compared to what our friend has signed himself up for every month for three, four, five years. I mean, it's never made sense to me because, uh, so I've, I've had some experiences like that too. Where I've lost considerable money on cars. I would say the Audi wagon was one of those because I, because it had a catastrophic mechanical failure while I owned it. And one of my 911s that I owned, I had an 87 Carrera 3.2 and uh, I spent $500 on a pre-purchase inspection, but the pre-purchase inspection failed to mention that the car did not, uh, th- that it was burning a lot of oil. So I ended up having to rebuild the top end and I did the clutch and stuff on that car. And so... Uh, I um, lost quite a lot on those two cars. Mm. Generally speaking, though, I, yeah, I haven't lost that much. But um, one of my friends, whom you know also, leased a new BMW M6. Uh, and it was, I did the math, it was basically over $70,000 to rent the car for three years. And then the residual was... 70 something thousand dollars on the car which me which is more than the car was worth on the open market at the end of three years because those cars depreciate a lot because it was i don't know what it was like a hundred and forty thousand dollar car or something like that uh so you pay seventy thousand dollars to be underwater on something at the end if you buy it or you turn it back in and then you that's the most economically sensible thing to do because it minimizes your loss to a mere seventy thousand dollars instead of you know, the additional $15,000 above the market value of the car that it, its residual is. If I lose $70,000 on a car, it had better be a fucking Enzo, right? I mean, it had better be something like, oh, I'll buy myself a Testarossa and it needs an engine rebuild by mistake. Or like, I just can't plan for that kind of loss. And okay, that friend is in a very, very diff- different socioeconomic bracket than I am. Um, but the, the leasing thing is a very interesting game. So... I, I I actually recommend leasing for to a lot of other a lot of people. And really? I know you, yeah, I, I really could never fathom it. I would much rather spend that money uh, on uh, maintenance instead of some terrible old car. Okay, this I love when we disagree about something because it's so rare. So so here's here's we are. I hesitate to use this word special. Tolerant. Th. Special. As I mean, as in, like, we have special needs and special care and feeding instructions that are required of us. We are enthusiasts, and we are, are willing to put up with, to your point, put up with mechanical maladies and squeaks and rattles and, you know, occasional engine explosions and stuff like that. Failures there, to proceed. Failures to proceed. There are people in this world, I do not speak to them or have anything to do with them, who need a transportation device and nothing more. And for, there, there are people who need to just get in their car and, and, you know, I am a surgeon and I need to get in my vehicle and I drive, I have to drive every day and get to the hospital by 6 a.m. or someone will die. What do I do? And of course, that guy's leasing a fucking Land Cruiser because there's nothing that can stop it. No, you know, no rain, no, oh, I could have done no, ain't no mountain high enough reference here. There ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley no, low enough, ain't no river deep enough. Why do wide, wide enough? enough? Wide enough. To keep him from getting to, to keep him from getting through. Um, and so here you have someone with, with you know, a, a steady income, <clears throat> a requirement to be a job, a re, uh, at their job, and they just need something that they don't give a shit about. They don't have to think twice about, like it'll go in once a year for service or whatnot. And they just, they're okay with paying a certain amount of fixed costs every month where there are no surprises. My lease is X amount of dollars every month. I never have to think about any more. Everything is included. And that's one of the benefits of like BMW's leasing, leasing, for example, with routine maintenance included. It's just a fixed cost, I know. $749.38 every month and I never have to think about transportation. And for those people, I tend to say, yeah, you, you may be better off leasing and here's why. I'm going to use BMW as an example here, only because I know the, the inner mechanisms of the way their leasing works more than any other particular car company. <clears throat> so overall, leases work in a very simple way. You have a negotiated price for the car, whether that's MSRP or you've gotten a discount on it. So you have your purchase price. 
And then you have what's called, and you know this, sorry if I'm boring you, but you know, maybe there's... I maybe don't know this. I don't know fuck all about leasing because I've never seriously entertained doing it before. Okay. Okay. Well then good. We can teach Derek and Tim hyphen Scott something. So there's a purchase price and then there's an estimated residual value. And these are called closed end leases, meaning you're determining what's going to happen at the end. Used to be that you could get an open end lease, which meant you're going to lease the car for X amount of dollars a month on a guesstimated value of such and such. And if the car was worth 10 grand less at the end of the lease, you were coughing up 10 grand to close out that lease. And obviously nobody wants to take that risk. I mean, that could ruin you. So all modern automotive leases are closed end leases, which means you have your negotiated purchase price and then you have your estimated residual value. And this is someone's estimate about what the car will be worth at the end of the lease, given the miles you're gonna put on it, given you know, the wear and tear that you're gonna to do to it, and given market conditions. And it's just an estimate. And there is no expectation that this estimate is realistic, right? So if I'm a car company, I can say, or bank, let's say I'm a bank, right? Derek wants to buy a three series and it's 56,000 bucks. I don't know, I chose, okay. It's 50, um, I chose that number in the car for a reason. It's $56,000 and you want a three year lease on it. And I estimate that at the end of the three years, that car is worth $20,000, right? Your payment is that $36,000 Delta or $300 a month plus fees and, and you know, the small amounts of interest and lease lease fees and acquisition fees and all the other crap that they throw in there, right? So you have a $300 a month payment and at the end of the lease, um, you can buy the car for 20 grand if it's worth maybe 25 and you can make five grand on it. But, and then the bank has to have some sort of disposition with this car. They gotta get rid of it one way or another. They can wholesale it, they can light it on fire and claim the insurance money, which is probably illegal um, or whatever. When you have a car company with a captive financial arm, like, i.e., they own the bank. They can do whatever they want. And so BMW, BMW Financial Services. BMW FS, exactly. So BMW owns BMW FS. And so they will say, well, hold on, Derek's $300 a month payment, it's a little bit tough on that car. We're not gonna be able to sell enough cars. And now BMW, this is a little bit long-winded, so I apologize. Shocker, I know, I'm talking too much. So BMW has contracted with all of the suppliers to sell X amount of units of this car. They're gonna, we're gonna sell X amount of this car and demand is not reaching where they need to be. So the suppliers are gonna go back and sue them and say, you committed to buy X amount of these ZF 8HP automatic transmissions or this, this amount of steering racks or this amount of air conditioning buttons, whatever it is. So they have to keep volume over a certain level. And then they have fixed cost in their factory. The, you know, the factory has a monthly mortgage on it and you have X amount of employees who you can't just tell, don't come to work because we're not selling all this many cars. Um, and you have all of these fixed costs that they have to meet. And so they price the car and they make this whole model and this is how the cars are priced um, so that it covers all of its costs above a certain, above a, above a certain um, uh, like uh, sales number. Um, and so they have to artificially pump up the sales numbers of this car to keep paying all that, to keep the factories humming, to keep the suppliers going. And you are not willing to spend $300 a month on your three series. So what's actually cheaper for them to do is kick the can down the road, meaning screw over BMW financial services. And what they do is they say, well, instead of this $56,000 car with a $20,000 residual, we'll sell the car for $56,000, which means we've booked a sale of a car. Like, haha, we can beat Mercedes at the game and we've booked $56,000 worth of revenue. But instead of a $20,000 residual value, your car is going to be worth $30,000. Let's say $32,000 worth of residual, right? So they bump up the residual by 20, 12,000 bucks. Now, all of a sudden, your payment is 56 minus 32. I did the $200 math. Totally a month. Wrong. $200 a month. Should be 34. I suck at math. Uh, now, all of a sudden, you've got a car that's $200 a month no, and you're going to buy 32. it. 24,000. Right. 24. That's not 30. Whatever. 56 what? minus 24. <laughs> 56 minus 24. It doesn't, the math is irrelevant. They artificially bump up the, I love how I just make excuses. Numbers don't matter when I'm discussing numbers. But they bump up the residual value to reduce your payments, right? So now, let's say the residual is now 24, right? What, whatever. 32. 22. 32. 
The residual is now $32,000. And at the end of the lease, you hand it in, say, here you go, eh, drop the keys and walk out. Now they have a, a car that the dealer has to buy from BMW Financial Services for $32,000. And what do they do? Now they're stuck with a car that's worth twenty, dollars because twenty dollars was what the car was really going to be worth. And they're going to lose $12,000 on the car. So they certify pre-own it and ship it out to someone else and get as small of a loss as they possibly can. Oh, and then they sell a service package. Oil change is only $12,000 a piece. And they make all their money back in service and warranty. And so modern dealers, and I, I know this for BMW, but I assume it's the same for everyone else, lose a huge amount of money on the sale of the car, use a huge amount of money on lease, dis- lease dispositions, and they make all of their money in service and parts. Um, and it's all there so that the car companies can just keep the volume up so they don't get sued by suppliers and they don't have a per unit cost that grows when, they, when the unit sales shrink. Um, as a result, you as a client, as a customer, have just bought a car for $200 a month that should never be $200 a month. Um, and you can go and look, and like a three series, you can look at average sale prices now versus three years old, um, and you can see what the real rate of depreciation was. And it's probably on most, like a base 330 is probably something like five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800 a month of actual losses when you could have gotten a lease for 399 or 329 or 279 all in, and that's with the down payment. And so there are a lot of people whose situations are, I want a fixed amount of money every month, I just, I want a new car every couple of years because I don't want problems, I want it to be, you know, roadside assistance, all the rest of the stuff, and they're far better off leasing it than they would have been to buy it. And it's just a game that the manufacturers play to sell them. Yeah, so that this is predicated on the assumption that you're cross shopping it with buying the car in cash. Right instead Correct. but Correct. i mean what i would do in the that situation is like this alpha julia situation is my dad has an m an e39 m5 and mm-hmm. i made him drive a julia quadrifolio and he's like oh i maybe kind of want this i mean i think also part of this is frankly is that he's like 80 years old and every car he has is a manual and i think that an automatic wouldn't be such a bad thing for him to have in any case um where I, I was sort of made him drive a Julia Quadrifoglio and he's like, ooh, this is kind of great. If you find one with the Sparkos in red, with the carbon fiber racing seats in red, let me know. And those cars are like, what? Look, your dad is in his 80s and wants carbon fiber racing seats. I'm sorry, he's my hero. <laughs> of course. Why would you not <laughs> choose the most spectacular seats there are? So cool. um, and okay, so, so those, those are like 45 grand. And so the question is, what, for like a, for a 15,000 mile Julia Quadrifoglio, for $45,000? <laughs> So it's like, why would you, when you could spend $1,125 a month to lease this thing new, and I have no idea if Alpha fudges numbers the way BMW does or doesn't. I assume they must because I remember seeing four-cylinder Julia's for like really low lease payments also because they're trying uh, presumably to compete with BMW. I don't know if they do the same thing for the quadrifolios or not. Uh, in Everyone any case, does, but I guarantee you Alpha doesn't do it for the quadrifolio, which is why that number is so outrageous. Yes, right. That makes sense. Uh, so if I could lease one for $1,125 a month or buy one for forty-five, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I, that's two or three years old. I would much rather do that. And that's the cross shop I would do rather than buying one for $80,000 or whatever those things cost new. I think that they start around seventy-five. Right, around eighty. But but you're far more risk you're far less risk averse than I think most people are right yes especially with an Alfa Romeo right because there's like I, I, and to some extent I'm like a little bit apprehensive about recommending that car to my father because like I mean he's retired so he doesn't really have to be anywhere he he like actually was a surgeon before he retired but now he's not a surgeon anymore mm-hmm. so he's not practicing so he doesn't have to be anywhere like super urgently so I guess that the, the the potential unreliability of an Alfa Romeo uh, could work with his lifestyle. <laughs> um, well, look, he also has he also has an E39 M5, which is now, you know, they're reliable cars overall, but that is still now a 15-year-old car. So clearly he's not in the camp of, I will only have Lexus and Toyota products that never break. Oh my gosh, no, yeah. yeah. So definitely not. Um, that could work for him. But yeah, I would definitely tend to say, as long as you, as long as a $6,000 repair doesn't break the bank. And there, so there are people for whom... Like, for, yeah, have good, they have somebody who has good income, but they don't have a lot of savings, you know, and they can afford, a, you know, an $800 or $700 or $500 a month payment, but a $10,000 repair will bankrupt them. And that's where leasing is, a, or, i.e. leasing or something under warranty is a much better idea. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, if your dad is able to, 
I mean, chances are he's paid off that E39, so he'll have at least that chunk of cash to place into, into the repair bills of the Alpha and not experience financial ruin if a computer explodes or something. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the deal. I think the inconvenience would be more the car's downtime than, uh, than the, the financial aspect of it. Um, it's just, it's shocking to me that, to, that for, there are large numbers of people out there for whom it makes sense to buy a new 3 Series at fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, and then you look at them when they're 10 years old and they're worth like $3,500 or something like that. I, I, I am very glad and grateful that we live in a part of the world that doesn't seem to value, I don't want to say the value, like this is a kind of tough prioritize. thing to say. Prioritize the amount of money and flash you spend on a car. Because really, you can have a much better car and a much <coughs> better Los Angeles. <clears throat> really? Oh, what? absolutely. Do you have the Corona? Do you got the Rona? Is that a Rona cough? <laughs> or did you just say Los Angeles? I would almost certainly probably do that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. No, Southern California has an amazing car culture. It's a very different car culture than most of the Bay Area. And that is for people who don't know California... You know, San Francisco and L.A. are right next to each other on the map, but they're actually 400 miles apart. Um, and they couldn't... Be, by distance. By, by distance. culture, they are 400,000 miles apart. Yeah. It's a very strange thing. You either... You like San Francisco or you like L.A., and there the two shall meet. I don't know anyone who's like, I could live in either place. Um, they're very different. And so the, the, I think that like a, cars and, like a typical Cars and Coffee in L.A. that I've been to is like... Lambos and McLarens and, you know, like big, 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 big expensive purchases. M4s out the wazoo and all this other stuff. And you go to a Cars and Coffee in, like, our favorite one, I think mine is anyway, is, is Berkeley. Berkeley, and yeah. there will be the $3 million Bugatti that shows up. Maybe. To, maybe. But there's also, like, and no one's really noticing. Like, that's not what it's about. There are no gold leaf wrapped Lambos and... Mm. Um, and but most of the cars are like weird, obscure shit. Like I've, I've said this before, you absolutely were standing in a puddle of your own fluids over some Lancia Flaminia. Berlina. Berlina with 72 windshield wipers on it. Um, <laughs> yes. And, and, it and created like weird old crowd. Alphas and VW buses and like oh, yeah. old trucks. and The assortment just... of stuff at that was like you could Volvos. never predict that mix. Amazing Volvos, including that one that you want with an LS swap in it, which is the hottest Volvo I've ever seen in my life. Um, there's, I mean, you know, there'll be a Honda Beat next to an Alpha GTV, next to my Scirocco, next to your 500e, next to you know, whatever it is. And I and I love that that whole crowd really appreciates like the batshit Peugeot 404 guy who just showed up and is like, look, I have a 404. Um, and but I really think the like it sounds very like oh we're in Northern California we're better. You can have a much better experience as a car guy without needing to spend money on depreciation because it's a very different thing than investing and spending. And if I was going to in, take twelve hundred or eleven hundred dollars, whatever the total is, that some total is, and invest it in something, it would be invested in an, a, an asset and not spent in depreciation. Um, and I can definitely see someone spending twelve hundred dollars in depreciation. This is someone who makes several million dollars a year. Um, or is just independently wealthy, and it winds up being a calculus that shows it's cheaper to lease a Bentley Continental GT for twelve hundred bucks than it is to purchase it. For example, um, I mean, it's you know. not even about like what's cheaper. It's just like this is what I want, and so I'm going to have it. Yeah, but I mean, fair enough. If you're, you know, this, I, I can't, I, I don't put a, a judgment call on someone that says I want it. But if you can have it for half the price, why wouldn't you? I mean. You know, look, the only cars I've ever leased in my life were, I had a Corolla in 94 that my parents made me lease, um, and my first e-golf. And so if you understand, this is, this was fun, because that lease cost me $83.77 a month. And if you understand the way leases work, right, you have the total purchase price minus the residual value. Well, resid was set on that car. I wanted the SEL, which gave me like the bigger screen and a bunch of other little crap, um, like a w steering wheel that wasn't made out of Barbie plastic. Um, but the, res the, the purchase price for the SEL was $8,000 higher than the SE, uh, and the residual was $50 higher. 
So I would have lost $7,950 over three years or two and a half years during that lease, which would have taken my payment and exploded it. But you know, the car was like 30 grand and then you get $7,500 back from the federal government and then you get $2,500 back from California and then you get a you know, check from the electric company and that just pushes the purchase price down and down and down and down. Um, and they had like $2,000 owner, owner loyalty and I'm certainly loyal to Volkswagen. Um, and Does like, owner loyalty know, work for something that old, for, for VW products that old? No, but I made a phone call to VW. And I, so I was calling to get, so they, Volkswagen has a friends and family program. It's not media or anything, but it's if you know someone who works at Volkswagen of America, they can get, they can get you 500 bucks off. And they get like a gift card for Starbucks. So I called a friend at Volkswagen of America and I'm like, hey, can you get me friends and family? And by the way, what's the deal with um, owner loyalty? And he's like, I don't know. I can look into it. I'm like, can, can you just agree with me about that there's no one more loyal to, loyal to his Volkswagens who hate him than me? And he was like, you're the biggest idiot the, on the planet. I'm like, great. I'm going to quote you on that. Can you please sign off on me getting an owner loyalty credit? Um, and actually, for a strange period of events, I had a 2001 or 2000, whatever it was, conforming car in my name for long enough for me to get a uh, registration card for it, which counted. So we got, we pushed it through. Um, mm. But yeah, I got all these discounts, which pushed the, the effective purchase price. Plus the dealer gave me a, like $8,000 off the car. So my purchase price wound up being uh, 2000, whatever it was. I think it was $2,496 uh, more than the residual value. And so my lease payment was that amount of money divided by the amount of payments. And that was my payment. Um, can't fault me for leasing a car for $84 a month. Yeah, that's I basically mean, free. Yeah, it was, I called it my free golf. Free <laughs> because, golf. Yeah, yeah, by the time it paid for its, uh, by the time I calculated out, if I drove 5,000 miles a year, which is what I did, the amount of money I actually spent on gasoline, uh, on electricity, uh, and compared that to the amount of money I would have spent on gasoline if it was a gas burning golf, um, the car wound up costing me $19 a month, and that includes insurance. Holy and, you know, hell. Yeah, that was it. That was my free golf. I mean, that's, so you can definitely play the leases to your advantage. Um, you know, the, and, the, and by the way, the residual value of that car was like 13000 bucks, and on the open market, I probably could have gotten fifteen for it. So then I started doing the math, like, okay, it's closed end deal. I don't, I, I walk away with nothing, but I have the option of buying it, and I could have bought it for thirteen. And but by the time you add sales tax in and um, and wait for the title and put it in my name and then take the chance, you know, of the market going down, I could have sold it and made a thousand dollars or two. So actually, you know, that car could have cost me like could have actually made nineteen dollars a month. Um, so you can you can definitely work it. I just. I, I think that I, I really always advise people to, to remember there's a very big difference between investing in an asset and paying for depreciation. Um, and 1100 and something dollars in depreciation. I love that Alfa Romeo Giulia, but there is absolutely no way that car is worth $1,200 a month to me. No, not, especially not when you could be buying one for $45,000. Yeah, that's crazy. So is there a car that's worth 12, that you would sign yourself up for for the next year and you'd actually pay 1200 bucks for? What is, so that's uh, uh, $14,400. Would mm-hmm. I pay 14400 I've done it. Before. Have I lost that much on a car? I don't know In if I've year. ever lost it. Mm. Like there are cars that I really want, but I can't. Would I do that? I don't, I don't think so. You love so. that, Julia. <laughs> yeah, but, but the urgency is not very high for that purchase, and I know they're going to continue to go down, which is part of the reason why That's I don't true. have one. Also, that I don't need it, uh, that there's no mission that it serves for me. Yeah, uh, Yeah, all the stuff I gravitate to, because I'm thinking about, like, oh, GT3, but it's like, oh, those cars don't depreciate that much. It probably has depreciated that much, especially with mileage. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, but also I intend to own the car for a long time such that the depreciation becomes sort of irrelevant because it's getting amortized over such a long time and the car's value is going to stabilize at some number, which is a pretty high percentage of its original purchase price, especially mm-hmm. compared to you know, a Mercedes S-Class or a BMW 7 Series or a Range Rover, which costs the same amount of dollars new because those cars all end up worth being worth you know, $7,400 when they're old I'm enough. I'm astonished at the actual amount of cost 
not investment, cost of owning, owning something like a 7 Series or an S-Class. I mean, you're talking $130,000 investment for something that, like, fascinating. You look at 3, 5, and 7 Series prices. And they all over, end up at the same number. Usually the three they're ones all are the highest. <laughs> they're all worth like five to $10,000 when they're yeah. 10, 10 years old or whatever. And it's really interesting that you sort of extrapolate that even another couple years out and the three series starts to go back up, the five stays level and the seven just plummets to negative. Like, what would, it, what would you pay right now for an E65 750? Okay, ask about an E38. E38. Because then okay. you're like, okay, that's kind of cool actually. E32 Great. is also... Okay, E38, amazing car, one of the best looking 7 Series of all time, great V12, nightmarish V8s, um, but whatever. Um, what are they worth? I think the finest one in the world with no miles on it, it's probably worth 20 or 25 grand, and I would say if you get a nice 75,000 mile one, which is still pretty low, it's probably worth like between 10 and 15, and okay, then the vast so majority a... of them are worth like $2,800. <laughs> Yeah, so here's the thing, you take a car that was like, you know, in today's dollars, $130,000, or thereabouts, and it's now, let's take a 2001 Shorty Sporty, which is the one that we'd both get, right? In Aspen Silver, that is the, no, now I'm going to have to look up a picture of an Aspen Silver fucking detail. Mine was blue. Okay, now you get to look up a blue one. This is the I game. I owned a like, blue one. I know, <laughs> so you're going to have a picture. picture. Oh, yeah, you're such I, a bitch. <laughs> this is the worst part of doing the Car Magic Show is that I have to play this back. Listen to all the stupid things I've said. Um, look at all the dirty looks you've given me, and then go well, find also an determining photo. what you yeah what you need to include a photo of. Oh of course. god, it's such a pain. Anyway, so you, like talking about oh sh- one shorty sporty, one hundred thirty thousand dollars depreciated down to ten. Oh one, call it thirteen and be generous. That's ten sure. percent. Thirteen. Well, I was just giving you a ten percent of one hundred thirty. Okay, so it's ten percent of its original value. I, I was just going to talk in gross dollar terms because let's now look at a 2001 m3 zcp there wasn't a competition back yet in 2001 but let's pretend there was oh five oh well it's not the same year you can't get an 05 e38 that's my problem mm. but let's say a mm-hmm. really really nice manual transmission no smg shit e46 yeah, in, m3 in phoenix yellow or some or le mans blue or some weird or color. Or, or le mans blue no it not le mans laguna sorry seca. uh laguna seca, laguna seca blue. LSD. um some amazing, you know, hold, hold on, no, 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 we were doing an average, like an average Aspen Silver okay. E38 to an average E46 M3 with 40, 50, 60,000 miles on it, like you just said, what's that worth? Well, I mean, okay, so $13,000 gives, yeah, get, for a 7 Series gets you a car with 75,000 miles right. on it. So 75,000 so mile M3 is probably worth twenty five. Even though... They blow up constantly. <laughs> like the Vanos units fail. They have bearing issues. They have all this other shit. They have ne- their maintenance nightmares, and it's still worth twice what the what the seven series was. Now let's think about a 2001 330i ZHP, if it existed. It didn't come out until the year after. Whatever. But let's say you have a just a nice three series with 75,000 miles on it. Run of the mill shit box. Nothing special about it. Even an automatic non sportback. Thirteen. It's a little high, 10. 10. My point is, it's the same price as a 7 Series. And the 5, an E39, 2001, 525i automatic, 10 grand. So no five, less. Okay. Like half I'm, that. Half, really? Yeah, I think so. Oh, fuck. Now I got an E39. <laughs> They're that cheap. For an automatic 525? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just amazing to me that people are willing to not invest, spend that kind of money. Like you could have an M3 will cost you half to own of what a 7 Series will. And I always look at total cost of ownership. Like I don't mind buying like the Ferrari. Let's, let's talk for honest for a second. I bought the Ferrari from you while I had no job. And it was a very upsetting um, chain of events because you called me and you're like, I'm going to sell it. And I'm like, don't. And you're like, you had first right of refusal. And I'm like, double do and you're like uh what do you think and i'm like mm, i'll take it and i got a uh very un- unfortunately timed text message saying that this one thing that i had been pitching and trying to make work didn't so all of a sudden i had no income and no prospect of an income um and as we're discussing the whole deal that happened and i thought you know what i'm investing money into a car that where that's 
worth it. So I can take it out of, you know, a bank account or a fund and put it into a car. And at least I get to drive the thing and all it's going to cost me is a belt service and whatever else breaks on it. But I'd rather that than, you know, leave it in the market and whatever. Um, I would have never signed myself up for a monthly lease payment where even 300 bucks a month was going out the door. Um, I mean, I would never do that either. Never, but also, never? I don't know, the trade-off, it's like, as, it, as it's even without the whole depreciation or the cost of ownership, the, the sort of just burning of money, um, the, the new car experience is not compelling enough for me to, to actively choose it over an old car experience. So when the, you factor in the money por- portion of it, as well, that makes absolutely no sense from my perspective. Uh, mm. Then there's, it's not compelling. In the Even, okay, so it's I actually you, actively told, distasteful to me. <laughs> if I told you to actively distasteful, did you just call me a dumb peasant? Um, uh, if <laughs> I told you, we have to add subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> Translation. So uh, if I told no, no, no. you, okay. So like the e-golf thing, it's like that's so cheap. Where you're like, oh yes, that makes a ton of sense. Right. I don't, that's, it, but it fulfills a mission that I don't need fulfilled. So I was just going to ask you, if I told you as of tomorrow, you lost your motorcycle license because, you know, somebody caught you doing a wheelie through a pedestrian zone and you're no longer allowed to ride a, ride a motorcycle and COVID's over and you have to go back to the office, which is a 40 minute, 45, 50 minute drive in traffic every day and 40 miles each way, whatever it is from your house. I don't even know. Consider a considerable commute. And you can have a GTI six-speed manual with plaid seats and a sunroof, for example, for $209 a month, including taxes, nothing down. Would you do it? Yes. <laughs> is, that what, is that the answer you wanted? I don't know. I don't know what, I, I, I don't know what answer you're going to give me. I mean, you're not in that situation, but most people are. Yes, yes, I, I get that. Or were I live in a place where I can motorcycle every year round, uh, and there's a meaningful benefit to that in terms of time savings due to traffic, and mm. I don't know. Do you I, lease your like, motorcycles? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> judgment in that look. Anyway. <laughs> Ew, David. <laughs> that was very like Alexis, uh, um, Alexis Rose. Uh, no. Here's what I do with my motorcycles. The motorcycles that I buy are like twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars motorcycles new. I buy them for like twelve, ten to twelve thousand dollars, with two, three thousand miles on them, mm-hmm. and then I ride them until they're at like ten to fifteen thousand miles, and then I sell them for nine thousand dollars. So they cost and you I've, three thousand bucks. Well, they're expensive to insure, or they were until I switched to, to Haggerty Insurance for them because they're not daily transport anymore. Uh, but they were a hundred dollars a month to insure, which was like astronomical to me. Is to spend a hundred dollars a month on something? I don't know. I won't tell you what my insurance bill is. I mean, well, no, no, no. My insurance bill for all of like for the collective cars is expensive, but for a particular for one vehicle, for me to spend. Because I would pay a yearly premium. $1,200 a year for insurance is a lot for me. I don't think I've ever paid more than... I bet the Lotus is that. The Lotus, I mean, but you look at it... Oh, no, the GT3 is it. more. Yeah. But, I mean, the GT3 is worth a lot more than a bike. You know? Oh, yes, it, for it sure. Could, it could conceivably have a $110,000 injury. Um, and not to be totaled. It. Yeah, not be totaled. Um, yeah, so they cost a lot to insure, but you really only lose 3000 But How long does it take you to put that many, many miles on the bikes? Uh, it depends on what my commute is, but it's generally like between one and two years. Okay, so let's call it eighteen months to lose three hundred uh, three thousand bucks on a car on the on the bike. I'm trying to just figure out what your monthly payment would be. So two hundred dollars a month. I mean, so you're effectively you know you have your transportation need solved for two hundred bucks a month plus insurance, and then quite a gas saving. So I'm guessing these things are far more efficient than most it's cars. It's like right? 35 miles a gallon. Far more efficient than any car you'd be caught dead driving. Yeah, especially <laughs> given the pace. If you adjust the, the fuel economy for pace, then, then it's, it's really stellar fuel economy. Trying to keep you out of jail there, <laughs> DTS. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say anything incriminating. I just said adjusted for pace. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, yeah, most of them get 35 miles per gallon at 140 miles an hour. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I am out of water. I can't do a spit take. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so really, though, you do actually spend 300 bucks a month on transportation. 
And I think that's a reasonable, I have a, I have a minimum. I have a free car. But I get me. so much joy. Like that the value is bonus, to me right? is, yeah. is so like, I, even if I, even if I weren't using it to commute, I think it would be worth it because I get that much. Uh, so, it. so the answer to your question is, would I pay, you know, what was the question? $1,200 a month? Mm-hmm. To for anything, I don't think so. But three hundred dollars a month, yes, absolutely, I, I would. And so I wouldn't I, lose that much if I didn't put so many miles on them. I mean, most of these bikes, because they, the like the Italian motorcycles, all get purchased by people who uh, have a lot of money, but don't aren't often aren't super hardcore motorcycle guys, and that's why it's so easy for me to find one that's three, four, five years old with two thousand miles on it, because they mm-hmm. just don't get used. Uh, and so it wouldn't be, the, the depreciation would be essentially zero if I weren't basically putting them in the 90th or 80th percentile in terms of mileage because there's so many of them out there with no miles on them. Look, look I, I think you're making the really a right decision. I hate that I have to agree with you here, but I, I have a floor and it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of moving inflation-based floor. And at the moment, it's sitting at around 250 bucks. And, and my, my point in that is you can purchase transportation for $250 a month, including insurance. And that's the absolute lowest you can go. And that is waiting all year and striking exactly when the iron's hot on the best possible lease deal, on the most efficient, and worst selling car in America. I mean, whatever it is, you just buy it. Um, and, and but what two, about your e-golf for 48 well, cents? Three. And that's so, that was such an unusual event. But on, for, in typical okay. cases, you can find towards the end of the year 169 a lease, a 169 a month lease on like a Jetta or a Civic or, you know, something. I don't really include Mitsubishi Mirage, you know, but there, there are definitely definite cars that you can get leases under 200 bucks a month. Um, often they'll require 100 bucks down. So or a thousand bucks down, which will mean, you know, a thousand divided by 36 payments or whatever it is brings that 169 to 199 and then you pay $50 a month insurance on the car and you're at 250. So like $250 is what I call basically free transportation. That's, that is the minimum it's going to take to get your needs met for most people in most situations. Um, anything in a car, uh, in a car, right. And anything above that is you're, you're spending extra money because you want to, because of the experience or because you enjoy driving. I do not begrudge anyone for saying, I could have a base Civic with crank windows if it existed, you know, like some, something I don't want just, just because it's $250 a month. Uh, but instead, I'm going to get an Alpha Julia TI, like a four-cylinder TI, for $400. Um, and I, I say right off the bat, $150 a month in, in you know, to, so the zero, that floor is $250. So you're spending $150 a month more. $150 a month of being an Alpha? To be one of the best driving cars on like sedans on the planet, 100%. Go for it. Do it. You be you. You only live once. You can't drive. Life is too short to drive Priuses. You know what I'm saying? Um, but I just, you know, th- I have to look at it that way because I'm beyond cheap. <laughs> and I bought most of my cars for 1500 bucks. If I think about it, our buddy's lease payment and insurance every month could have bought almost every one of my cars in one month. No. Yeah. I paid fifteen hundred. That's because you have so many Scirocco. damn Volkswagens. <laughs> but I paid fifteen hundred bucks for the Scirocco. I paid fifteen hundred bucks for the E thirty. I paid twenty two hundred dollars for the Cabby. There's another one that I paid like fifteen hundred bucks for. Not the Lotus. Not the Lotus. Lotus the and Mercedes. Ferrari were the Mercedes wasn't that bad. Mercedes was still in the it was a low a five digit number that started with a one. Nothing. I got that right at the right time. Um, the only cars that I've ever spent more than, hold on, let me just double check this. 996. Yeah. I mean, I spent 39 on a 996. I spent, I've never spent more than 41 on a car in my life. Um, and I've had some pretty cool cars and I compare this to my sister. Like my sister is amazing. I love her. I don't want to bash her. However, (laughs) there's a butt coming. (laughs) God, you found this. However, um, and she drives right now, she drives a Mazda 6, six-speed manual in black, and it's hey, fucking all right. awesome. And I had nothing to do with this. This is the best part. She brought her husband's CX-9 in for an oil change, and the salesman That's comes That's how over they she, get you. Right? And, you know, my sister is ridiculously fucking hot. And so she's on the lot, and of course, every salesman's coming out. And she's like, oh, leave me alone, leave me alone. This one guy comes up and is like, 
uh, you know, what's it going to do to take you to, to, to get you to drive away in that car? And she just looks, gives this guy a like, typical New Yorker dirty look. And she was like, yeah, if it was a fucking stick, I would drive it off the lot today. But it's not. So fuck you. And the guy was like, that, that black one? That, that one's an actual a manual. And she was like, they don't make this car in a manual. And he's like, that's a stick. True to her word, she drove it off the lot. <laughs> she left the CX-9. She told him, go get your own freaking car. I'm driving my new. And she got rid of the minivan. She has, you know, the kids, she was like, They're, they can sit in the back seat. We sat in the back seat. She had she'd been driving a minivan. And I think had just started to realize that like mommy life was not the only life there should be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she's got this hot Mazda 6 stick. Um, but if I look back through the cars that she's had over the years, she had a Honda Element that she loved. She had a Passat 1AT wagon uh, that she loved. She had a Sentra SE that I made her buy. She had a Jeep Cherokee, the 2.5 Coupe in 1986. And I'm not looking up any of the inserts, so don't even bother to look at the screen because I'm not digging up these pictures. Except the SE. I have really cool, good pictures of that little Nissan Sentra SE. SE was the SER, but it still had the 1.6 or 1.5, the little motor, and like it had alloy wheels, but they were 13s. They're so cute. Just like, I don't think you can even find tires for those. Probably not. But it did have like the SER spoiler and the SER seats. But if I look at the number of dollars, and then of course there were all the minivans from the kids. If I look at the number of dollars that she has spent, meaning gone, on her cars, I bet she has spent a 10 to 15 times the amount of money that I've spent. And right now she has a fully depreciated 120,000 mile Mazda 6. And I have seven cars with a combined value of Far in excess of, of a Mazda six, Mazda six, one hundred twenty thousand miles on it, um, and I've and I get to drive a Ferrari around and a Lotus around and a Mercedes and a BMW and yes, a couple of Volkswagens. No one's perfect. Um, yeah, I just think there's a smart way of doing car stuff. Well, yes, and, and that has always like... been the attraction of vintage car or old cars in general, and this is why I always gravitate towards Radwood era cars because you can get so much car for the money. Uh, and of course, what I'm cross shopping against is stuff from the fifties and sixties that's actually valuable instead of this mm. sort of radwood definition of valuable which is like oh that's an expensive one it broke twenty thousand dollars um, money that's outrageously expensive i mean you can get so much car from that era for seventy five hundred bucks or fifteen thousand yeah. dollars it goes a hell of a long way for radwood era cars that's which got to be the really hard part about your world like your world at least me your world you know in, in your previous you know companies where you've always been in this world where like a quarter million dollars is just a normal like, well, it's actually kind of entry level, which is odd. Oh. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's crazy. Especially for vintage cars. And it's like you look objectively. I, I talk about this often, objectively, about what comes with an old car. And you're, you try to explain it to people. They're like, why is this old Ferrari worth $3 million? Well, And then it's like, well, you know, it's not fast or efficient or safe. And it smells bad. And uh, it's not, like, reliable either. Um, and it's not like really a good car at all, actually. So that's why it's worth so much money, um, <laughs> obviously. And then they're just like, uh, huh? what? Are you sure about that? Yeah. This doesn't calculate. That's In any so case. Weird. Because you're not, because that car is no longer transportation. And that's the, that's the answer well, to Well, yes, question. that's actually the answer to that question is that, that it's not a transportation device anymore. It is an objet d'art. It is I a collectible. going to say exactly that word, except I was not going to do this snooty, pretentious French accent. An object of art. Yeah, which is bad enough, but objet d'art is even worse. That's right. I have to make fun of you. It's my job. It's what, the, what I get paid for. I'm not complaining. Carry on. Let Damn me know it. when you're done. We'll move on I would like, to the next topic. I would like for you to complain. Would you like that. exasperation? Here, I'm going to spray this drama spray at you. And isn't Here's some exasperation. Thing? Drama isn't this the spray. the coolest thing ever? My friend Tim got this for me. I have no idea what it does. It says, cap approximates color of contents, and it's sort of a like a hazy, filmy white, and it's drama spray, clear plastic. Like, I don't know what this does, but I'm afraid to open it up and spray it at myself because I'm frankly high drama enough. You should Shake sp- well, listen for rattle of agitator, continue shaking for at least one minute. Or you could just spray it on uh, hapless passersby and see how that goes. <laughs> uh, have we covered Sorry. the topic of today sufficiently? Was there other... What, what was the... Let's, uh, I think the takeaway is you take have away? to be out of yes. your fucking mind to spend $1,200 on an Alfa Julia Quadrifoglio, despite the fact that it is an amazing car. Because what about $2,500 a month on an M6? Or whatever those cost. I don't, I don't know. 
Uh, maybe it's two thousand dollars a month. Two thousand. Think about. <laughs> I mean, think about what you could do with seventy five thousand dollars over three years. Oh yeah. Right. That's a mortgage. That takes most people 30 years to pay. Mm-hmm. I just, there is no car worth 2000 Hold on, let me think about this. Like, is there, is there if really... If the car a, is appreciating at a rate of more than $2,000 yeah, a month... Yeah, but then you're not leasing it, right? You're, it, or right. if it's appreciating, right? Then, you, then, you're, then you're buying into an investment. Yes. But is there really a car that's so good to drive... Oh, that I would no. spend two thousand dollars. But you're a month clearly not the right? you're you're not calibrated regarding money the way that the people who do this I, are. Yeah, uh, because I'm sure the people who watch this, and I'm sure they'll say things in the comments like, "How could you say it's reasonable to spend four hundred dollars a month on on a three series?" I don't. I wouldn't. There's no way three hundred dollars a month to lease anything. I just no. There, absolutely not. But I'm not a high high paid doctor who needs to be at work. Or someone who can't fix their own car, or you know, whatever. I don't understand this whole like luxury car thing. To be honest with you, I think you know most cars just suck, and they're not worth their real prices. This is why you're a car mudgeon. Yeah, I got a true story. I had an, I had an Aston V8 Vantage, the new one, 183 thousand oh, yes. bucks, I think it was. Holy uh, hell, those are 180 grand for the eight cylinder. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> um, and. <gasps> I giggled because the guys, the, the fleet guys who come and manage this stuff, dropped it off and handed, took the Aston key and gave me a Kia key. Um, and I look outside and there they are parked next to each other, an Aston Martin V Advantage and a Kia Forte GT. And I'm like, what, you know, one of those days where everyone's like, oh, you should love your job. Everything's amazing. And I'm like, for every Aston Martin, there's six Kias and, you know, three Mitsubishis. I I had to move the Forte because it was blocking my driveway. Um, and I got in and my first thought was, oh, thank God. Like the interior is actually nicer <laughs> than the Vantage is in, in terms of just, you know, like a cohesive look. And that Vantage is completely covered in uh, Alcantara like someone took uh, like a luxury mansion and covered the entire thing in shitty wall-to-wall carpet. And when I say the whole thing, I mean wall, ceiling, kitchen, countertop, toilet, the whole thing. Like the whole car is completely covered in Alcantara. The, the Kia has different textures, some of which are really shitty, but textures and colors and finishes. And I'm like, oh my God, the infotainment system works. Like boop, 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 boop. Like it's like touchscreen and the whole thing worked. And I took it for a ride around the block and I made it like four cars, uh, four houses down and the words left my mouth. I'm like, oh shit, Biermann did this. Albert Biermann is the, is the old BMW exec who is now, he did all the M cars and he's now doing all the Hyundai stuff. And its signature is just slathered all over the car. Steering, ridiculous. Engine's got a great note. The transmission does these little, the little you know, sporty car farts on, on the upshifts. And everything is amazing. Sticker price with heated and cooled seats, Sunroof, I mean, every single option, automatic climate control, everything you could ever want, $26,000. Wow. And I thought, at price parity, I would rather drive the Kia. <laughs> now you factor in the fact that you have to buy the Kia and then purchase another one or spend another $150,000. Um, so, you know, your three year total cost of ownership on the Aston is probably going to be 100 grand because they're worth 50 grand at, at three years old. Um, and your total cost of ownership on the on the on the Kia will be worth on the order of like twelve thousand dollars. I just don't get it. Why would you buy an Aston? Uh, make, it's the you... it's to people want to have the badge. I don't know, or they're yes. not calibrated. I think a lot of people think that they genuinely enjoy certain experiences because they haven't had other experiences to compare them to that demonstrate it's like ignorance is bliss maybe ignorance is bliss if you like that experience and you don't find it objectionable then it's maybe worth it to you and it satisfies your personal utility function fair enough fair enough i mean here's the thing if you like that smv advantage don't talk to me ever again i could understand spending one hundred eighty thousand dollars on an og dacht like i.e. the previous generation V8 Vantage, which was stunningly beautiful inside and out and drove even better than it looks. This thing is ugly outside, ugly inside, and drives like garbage. Um, and yeah, that's when I get really angry. But may, I don't know if it's because I'm a car mudgeon or because I'm a cheap mudgeon. 
why are those con- like or maybe you're both okay well we need to come up with a name with that name for that okay you can nice. ruminate on that before next week's episode okay uh, we will start next week's episode with my self-insulting name terminology self. that encompasses both cheap mudgeon and car mudgeon yeah okay right. and then you you got to find something for yourself because i mean or we could just stick with hyphen like sorry fine by me all right i'm gonna i'm gonna send you my uh hair cutter so we can open next week's episode with what the fuck happened to your face <laughs> just you know to get your back okay thanks until next time don't forget to like and subscribe if you liked what we said or didn't like what we say and remember that the comment section below is where you should write terrible things about Derek M. hyphen scott and nice things about me like san lu looks 10 years younger or i leased my car for 3800 dollars a month and you're a moron camisa all that fun stuff and if you subscribe and click the notification bell well well then you'll just get an email next time we say terrible things to you am i done yet yeah i think so i'm ready for bed it's three o'clock this is a long day spirit age confirmed (laughs) all right my fiber Okay, I know what to get you for Christmas. I'm going to get you like a, a beautifully wrapped Metamucil bottle. <laughs> oh, is it Christmas yet? Mm. I hope I live that long. Fuck. All right, stay safe. Don't get the coronavirus because at your age, you know. Oh, yes, high mortality. high mortality. Same to you, although you're less in danger now that you're 10 years younger. <gasps> I like that. Great, we'll end right there before you say something mean. <laughs> If you enjoyed The Carmudgeon Show, make sure you subscribe to the ECME YouTube channel and click that notification bell to make sure you're told every time we publish something amazing, which is basically every time we publish anything. Are we done yet?